In this final video lesson, we look at some next steps for the CICD system we've created. First, there are some potential pipeline improvements to move closer to a production grade system. And then regarding STM32 Cube IDE, so far we have focused on a single developer. I want to talk a little bit about having multiple developers working on a common project. Listed here are some ideas for improvements that would bring the pipeline closer to a production grade system. This isn't a complete list, but are things that first came to my mind. The first two involve replacing the very simple remote repo on our laptop. That was fine for our demo, but not realistic for a production system. Now one option is to create a network-based private Git server for the remote repo. It could be on a physical server or in the cloud. Uh, in either case, maybe running in a Docker container. In contrast, what was done uh, for the demo, we need to have a secure interface with keys. The nice thing is that from a developer's and from Jenkins' viewpoint, this should just be a change in the URL for the remote repo. So an alternative is to use GitHub. Again, it will have a secure interface with keys. I think GitHub basically forces this to be done these days. One challenge will be to figure out how to get a web webhook trigger from GitHub to your build server, possibly passing through a firewall. Now, I believe GitHub actually has the ability to do builds. I'm not sure how this works with embedded, but it would be something to look into. Of course, we also have to consider how we would do our hardware in the loop testing. So the next improvement is a system I have seen a few times. In this class, when we had some code ready, we would simply push it to the remote repo. In this case, you do something similar, but the code actually doesn't go into the remote repo, at least not on the official branch, until the pipeline runs without error. So it prevents, or tries to prevent, bad code from ever getting in. I don't know how these systems work exactly. The first step is to research this. A key to this being successful, and I can speak from experience, is to ensure that the automated test and the pipeline in general are very reliable. It can be frustrating to developers and hurt productivity if their submissions get rejected due to some uh, build issue unrelated to their code. And the final improvements listed here is not, a, not big ones. It is more security improvements relating to the webhook build trigger and the email notification system. They need to be key-based and not be using passwords. The final topic I want to discuss is having multiple STM32 Cube IDE developers. So far, we have really just focused on a single developer. So I'll start with a picture. It's a lot like the other pictures you've seen, except now we have the second developer. So on this picture, we see several copies of the repo. The official one is up in the Git server. Uh, the Jenkins has a copy of the repo. It's sort of a read-only version. It doesn't change it. And then the developers have copies of the repo, which they are um, potentially changing uh, simultaneously and at various times pushing it back up to the uh, remote repo. So this looks like a great setup and use of Git, uh, but there are potential issues related to some IDE-related files in the repo. So let's look at that. So here are some issues. One is that storing IDE uh, project properties or settings files in the repo could be an issue if these files contain data that is specific to a developer's local environment. And the example I give is that the settings file has full path names in it. So I saw an example of that in the .mx project file and, and that was of concern. Now, one simple and practical solution might be to have all project folders be at a fixed location for all developers. So in other words, as a project, you get together and say everyone needs to put their CICD class uh, 1 uh, IDE project folder at this location. And then, of course, the problem goes away. I don't know if this solves everything, but it is certainly something to look at. Now, there could be further issues if properties and settings files that are logically the same are not literally identical. 
So an example would be a settings file where the line order is not fixed, it's somewhat random. And so you have two developers who have identical settings, but their settings file is not literally identical. So the problem is this could result in some settings files being what I call whipsawed as diff different developers push uh, changes to the remote repo. So developer A uh, pushes their changes with a particular settings file. Developer B now pushes their changes. And even though the settings are the same, their settings file looks different. And so that goes in as a change um, from a Git viewpoint. And so if you look at the history of that repo, you see this uh, settings file being changed all the time. And that it maybe would work, but it isn't ideal. So in general, more investigation is needed to understand these kind of issues. Uh, perhaps a little Googling will un uncover the answers to this because, of course, this is, uh, you know, lots of people must have run across this. One thing that occurred to me is it might be advantageous to layer the project files into several repos, and I'll show you that now. In this diagram, I show a layering of files in the project folder. Each layer is potentially stored in a different Git repo. So at the top layer, we have the application code that is handwritten, or at least not supplied by the IDE. Obviously, these files will be exactly the same for all developers. Now, this code is typically hooked into IDE-generated code in a small number of places, for example, main or maybe exception handlers. We saw that in this course. It may be that this software is common to multiple MCUs. For example, there will be if defs to handle different MCUs. And thus, this code might appear in multiple IDE projects. That might be another reason to keep it in a separate repo. The next layer down is the IDE maintained files that should be identical for all developers. So this includes the IDE generated code and the source code that is uh, copied into the project, for example, from libraries. Uh, the make files, the linker scripts, and other build files that are generated by the IDE, and probably this hardware configuration file, it's a .IOC file. Uh, with this exception, these are files that are needed uh, to do a build. And then the final layer, or the lowest layer, are files that might have some per-developer differences. So a key thing about these files is they're not required for CI-CD builds. All you need is the code and the make uh, files. So these could be stored in a per-developer repo or a single repo with per-developer folders. Now, each developer in this case would have to ensure that with their IDE properties and settings repo, that if they generate uh, the code up in this layer here, they will get the same generated code as everyone else. That's a key uh, requirement for this to work. So if you were to do something like this, it would require a method to layer these repos in the IDE project folder. And so you would have to have the methods on how you make changes and how you push changes, how you handle changes that have to be coordinated between uh, different layers. So it sounds like an interesting project. I haven't done anything with it, but I wanted to present these ideas. Well, that is the end of this lesson and the end of the course on embedded CI CD with hardware in the loop testing. I hope you found it useful, and again, thanks for watching.